Lovely. And the most probably we are live, right, guys? We are live, but look, as you know me, I just have to double check quickly because I need to be. And there we go. And there we go again. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are in the world. I'm so happy to be here with you, all of you today. This is a new episode of the Truth Runners Talk Show. And I am very, very happy because our topic is different today. And my guest is very, very special as well. I would love to welcome Hilda, Hilda Kellogg to our show today. So welcome, Hilda. Thank you so much for accepting my invitation. Well, thank you very much, Christina, for having me on your show. I'm just honored to be here and to be able to talk about this topic with you. My great pleasure. Hilda is new to the Truth Runners talk show. So Please allow me, guys, to introduce her to you so you know who our guest today is. She's a life and business coach, a trainer, an energy healer, writer, and speaker who helps people to overcome anxiety during times of massive change, to become more confident and trusting in their own abilities, to create the life what they want. Her new organization, Roots of Hope, works with children, young people, individuals and corporates, and storytelling at the heart of the service she offers. Hilda speaks on topics such as diversity and inclusion, gender equality, mental health, and overcoming grief and loss. Two interesting facts about her. She she's well, <coughs> English, having gone to school with JK Rowling and being part of a global campaign to ban landmines spread by Princess Diana which won the Nobel Prize, resulting in a treaty signed by almost 200 nations to ban these heinous weapons. Wow. Hilda has written four books and runs a masterclass called Writing for Wellbeing Online and Face-to-Face. -face. She's the UK ambassador for a global initiative to empower women called Empowerment Through Spoken Word Poetry with Dr. Anita Caprice. So I'm so happy, Hilda, and honored to have you as my guest. So welcome again. Oh, thank you. Well, I'm thrilled to be here. And when you read all that out, I was thinking, really, have I, do I do all that? But um, I enjoy what I do. And yeah. Yeah, sometimes, you know, it's very interesting that you said that because when some people, you know, sometimes when people introduce us, we stay and listen and like, who is that woman? She's doing all that thing and wow, mm. wow, wow, beautiful soul and doing all those kind of things. So wow, that's so before we really go into our topic, I would love to ask you what I always love to ask my guests. Who are you, Hilda? Who you truly are? Who am I? Mm -hmm. I in my heart, I'm an old soul. Mm. Um, I'm a light worker and I'm here to support people to live their best lives and to remove the fear that may be holding them back, so especially women and girls. Thank you. I can see you, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. You're welcome. So our topic from today is, it's going to be hard to pronounce for me, so bear with me, guys. This is my third language, okay? It's bereavement and loss. Yes. Okay. And it's a very interesting topic because most of what I'm experienced is most of the coaches and mentors, they kind of run, they don't really like to discuss, especially not in public, the topic because it's a little bit, they say, heavy. Yet I am very happy that you choose the topic because it's important. It is very, very important. It's present in everybody's life. Yeah. None of us is an exception for that. Yeah. So, so thank you for being brave and being bold and choosing the topic. I, I really, truly appreciate it. And I would love to ask you, what experience do you have of bereavement and loss? Well, gosh, when I look back over my life and I'm now in my 50s, I think about the very first time when I was five and I took my first plane flight. My mother's from Russia and we took a plane from Moscow to London and immediately I lost my family. I lost my grandmother, my grandfather, my uncles, my aunts, my cousins who were all in Russia and I didn't see them again for 15 years. 
And then I didn't know about my father's side of the family. He never really talked about them, but he was one of 10 children. And I had discovered after his death and piecing the jigsaw puzzle together that I actually had on his side, I had 54 cousins, which I didn't even know existed until I was in my 40s. And I visited his country and met many of them for the first time. So that was my first experience of loss. And then I, we were all touched by this. I lost my father when I was 26. He was only 48. He died of a brain tumor and that affected me deeply. And then friends and other family members passed. And then I went through a divorce. And then I had a miscarriage when I was four months pregnant. Um, so lots of loss of different types. And on top of all that, what people might not think about as loss, moving jobs and not seeing those friends and, and people you work with. I've probably had 80 jobs, maybe more. I don't know, a lot of jobs um, and moved on and not always kept in touch with everybody. Um, and moving house many times as well, different areas of the world. Mm, wow. This, I mean, if someone can talk and share about how to cope, then I guess you are the person yeah. here that, I mean, how would you, how would you define grief? What is grief oh, really? Yeah. Well, grief is um, an, another form of love but it's love in that form where you have lost somebody either through death or you won't see them again for another reason. You may be estranged from them or you, you move country and you don't see them. Like in your case, for example, right? When you yeah. lost your family, like I've seen them for many, many years. That is not. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and as you get older, sometimes it's more difficult to, to cope with than when you're a child. Um, but So grief is a form of love, but in another form. Grief is also all those um, feelings of, you know, if your spouse, your partner is, has passed unexpectedly, or even you were thinking you knew it was going to happen, it's still a profound, a profound experience when you do lose them, even though they might have been ill for a long time. It's also the plans that you had, all the things that didn't materialize, like you were planning to get married or have children together or, you know, be be together for a long time, buy a house, do have all those adventures. So grief is also that. And grief is also when um, you move out of the pattern of what you were used to. So you'd have that person or it could be an animal with you that whole time. And then suddenly they're not, not no longer there and there's this big hole. And that's, that's the pattern that's changed for you. So all those are definitions of grief. May I ask you a very might be a strange question, but do you think that we human beings know we know how to grieve? <laughs> I think some people grieve on their own, and there's been a lot of uh, research that when you grieve on your own, um, it's not healthy for you. Mm. But when you grieve with others um, in a non judgmental space, then it's more healthy. I mean, I just when I was talking about my Russian side of my family, they used to go to the graveside of their of their parents, my grandparents, my uncle would, I remember him sitting there in the graveside on a weekend with his little glass of vodka and his bread and his fish. And he would just open up his food and sit there with some other relatives and they would chat and they would raise a toast and they would talk lots of stories, share lots of stories about that person until they were very drunk. And, and it was all kind of like a celebration of their life. But when I came to the UK, I didn't experience that uh, with my friends, families so much. And I wondered why people didn't talk about it very much. So there's very many different ways of grieving. Yeah, I think it's different. It's different because, you know, I was born in East Europe as well. I was born in Romania and I know I'm experienced. I'm seeing that we grieve differently. And the reason why I asked you the question is because sometimes people don't allow themselves you know they don't give yeah. themselves the time to grieve yeah. they start to live in denial and then all those kind of emotions and everything they got it got trapped in the bodies right and it's just accumulating the energy because being very honest we are not taught 
how to grieve, for how long to grieve, what it means to a healthy grieving, and yeah. what is a prolonged grief. Yes. And people suppress those emotions and then they will have emotional outbursts, which actually did happen to me after my father died. I had a big emotional outburst because I kept it bottled up for a year and I was consumed with my work. You know, people go into maybe they take alcohol or they get become workaholics or they, yeah. you know, other things. All kind of predictions. Yeah, true. Yeah. Um, and um, it, it would be good if it was like a healthy way to grieve. So, for example, I've got a friend whose husband passed of kidney cancer recently and she's now training to run a marathon in honor of him and the a kidney cancer charity. So this is for me a, a healthy outlet. And for her, obviously, you know. Mm. Yeah, this is really, really important because I, I'm saying that we are not taught, we don't know how to grieve, we don't know how to cope with that. And sometimes, you know, we have this prolonged grief. What exactly that, that means? Uh, yeah, prolonged grief is when you have grief for at least 12 months and it's still very central to your life. So your focus every day is on whoever, whatever that loss is, and you cannot move on and it's affecting you. Um, you, ha you haven't been able to integrate it into your life. You haven't been able to really come to a place of um, processing and, and more acceptance and it's affecting you mentally, emotionally, physically. You might have you know pains in your body you you know you might be very anxious and still depressed and that is uh, what is prolonged grief and everybody obviously grieves differently you know there's no you have to stop grieving at 12 months or three three days or whatever it is everybody is different so, but what i'm seeing is and what i'm saying is yes grief you have to allow yourself to grieve yeah but also you have to know when it's time to move on. I'm not mm -hmm. saying to, you know, people say and coach say, let go. I mean, I don't, honestly, I don't really like, I'm not, <clears throat> yes. let go. It's, it's about really adjusting. Mean, it's about adjusting. It's exactly. not kind of, you haven't moved on in the sense of, you know, that's a, a, that used to be the expression and we tend to still use it, but the, yes. the language around it is, is adjusting now and um and being able to um accept it and to uh cherish that person but it's not in uh, a way in your life now where it's central to your life and the focus is still on them mm. true how is grief different after bereavement due to suicide bereavement. yes well there's a term for that and it's called postvention and um well i mean suicide the question is always why why um, you know why and often people won't leave notes um and sometimes if they do it even raises more questions and um, answers and there is that sudden shock and with suicide uh, more people will have been affected by it because mm -hmm. it's you will have the first responders, perhaps, you know, the emergency services, you'll have the relatives, you'll have, it'll be more public because there'll usually be an inquest. So it'll be in the news, what's happened. There'll be investigations and questions asked of everybody to try and understand what piece it all together. And then there's the guilt and the, and the shame mm -hmm. uh, and, the, and the shock for that, um, for that, the people affected. Um, and, and, Unfortunately, those that are affected, though I read some research that 67% of those affected by someone's suicide are likely to think about suicide themselves. Wow. So that's, that's how it's different. Um, hmm. Okay, this is a topic I could go in really, really, because you were talking about things what comes up after, you know, the shame and guilt. Yes. You know, shame and guilt are really, really just human manipulations is something which is like conditioning that that's again another topic really what i was thinking is that <clears throat> just just to summarizing this first part really is that we are number one not taught how to grieve that that's for sure and i've learned from you that and yes we all grieve differently but the more important thing is to allow ourselves you know, to grieve, don't suppress the emotions, the, the emotion of grief, yeah. because that causes um, 
this is right this is in body it can even <clears throat> bring to addictions you were talking about that as well so it's it's really 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 a all right interesting topic right i could be here for a long long time but i would love to change the tone a little bit and i would love to ask you about your new business because you said you changed a lot of jobs and you did mm -hmm. that and that and that's okay i always say if you don't feel good in a place move you are yeah. not a tree okay you are not good if there is just you can move you have to feel you can move until you find something which resonates which is in alignment <clears throat> and if you're yeah. not then you just create a way for yourself and i think this is exactly what you just did right yeah yeah so your new business is called the root of hopes yeah. Of hope. yeah 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 so it's a it's a health and well-being business i'm passionate about supporting people to let go of fear let go of anxiety so that they can move forward in their life with more faith and self-confidence because if you think about you were talking about conditioning from a very young age i mean girls as young as six are, uh, are already feeling ashamed of their bodies or they're comparing themselves to others or they're you know wanting the latest clothes and maybe their parents can't afford them and things like this and there's all this conditioning that's happening okay. and and uh, holds us back as adults because it gets ingrained in our subconscious thinking so it's about kind of rewiring helping you to rewire your yourself and your thinking uh, so that you can progress you can move forward it doesn't mean that you're not you're going to be positive all the time no you know you have a cry have, let it out let those emotions out when you're really upset about something and and then and then think about why you were upset you know reflect on it and then think about how you can move on as well. What steps can you take? So it's, it's about, I really feel passionate about supporting children um, with this, because as I said, you know, I think they did research and children were at the age of six, girls and boys are generally both outspoken, use their voices, pretty confident, say what they think. You know, if they say something to you, it's like, I don't like your top, I don't like the color, that color, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of nice it's kind of charming and it's honest and but then within by the time they're 11 it's very different so it's i i would love to see children grow up to their full potential as adults because we're going to have a better society that way we're going to have a better world that way so roots of hope comes from um my father was born in a house called lesperance in south america and it comes from that, really, because l'esperance means hope in French. And, and him and all his siblings were born in this house. And on his side, I noticed that there were all these things that they did that nobody in the family had done. So they were kind of the first in the family to do this. My grandparents left India. They were the first to leave the caste system in India. They didn't want a part of it. They wanted to create their own kind of life with more social upward mobility. And then my father was the first in his family to get a scholarship and go overseas mm. and study. And he became an engineer and got a degree in civil engineering. And he was the first in his family. And he built a bridge back in Guyana, his home country, which connected the river left and right side of the Demerara River. And so people didn't have to take the ferry for eight hours to go to the market. They could just take the bridge and drive across in half an hour or so. You know, that's what he gave back. And he was the first in the family to do that. My mother was the first in her family to get on a plane and leave communism behind because she was born in Russia. She, at the height of the Cold War, she had married my father and took about six months, but she left Russia with all the bureaucracy and the paperwork tied up. You know, it was all done, took a long time, but she did it. And she was the first to say, look, I'm going to start a new life. I've got faith and hope and confidence in myself to do that. And I'm going to leave and, and start anew. So I, that's what it's about. That's what's at the root of it is to say, I have the faith and confidence in myself and I want to do what makes me happy and fulfilled, but also to help society if I can in some way. And, and it's letting, I'm letting go of my anxiety because there's a lot of anxiety around at the moment, isn't there? The cost of living and the war in the Ukraine and other places and all sorts of negative news and but yet we can step outside of that but it means 
getting some support to do that and thinking in a different way. And so that's what it's, this business is about. Wow, thank you. And I'm loving what you said, that you love to work. Thank you for sharing the story of your family. It's really inspirational. You say, if you can have, I think you already did. Oh, you, already, you. you already did, you know, just sharing our experiences, our stories, you know, sharing how we went from A to B, how we went from down to up and how we changed and how we shifted. Yeah. That, that, that is already a help to someone, to somebody who listens or, or who watches really. So I love that. And you were talking about loving to work with children, right? And, yeah. and our education system. What it just actually crossed my mind is that, you know, we, we can actually teach our children how to grieve and how to, to cope with grief from a very young age. Because what we do right now, we just don't want to bring them around grief and sadness. So we kind of, we think, that we protect them. Yeah. But what in fact we do, we are not protecting them at all. We're just not preparing them to what's going to happen, you know, when as, as they grow up, right? They will experience more and more loss, more and more grief, more and yeah. more, okay? And they will not be able to cope because nobody taught them. So yeah. if you're working with young children, you know, and, and having these organizations of hope and just cross my mind that it actually would be really, really nice if we teach the things to our children. I already, my first picture book that I wrote, it's in a series called Donna and Dermot. So Dermot is this dog and Donna is his good friend and they have adventures together. And this book is all about moving house and missing your friends, missing your grandparents moving house. And Donna's lying on her bed and she's feeling really, really upset. And of course, dogs and, and pets, animals are always in the moment. They're always, always in the moment. And they don't give you a chance to really get too upset because they don't hold grudges. They don't, they don't feel, you know, depressed like that. And so the dog Dermot cheers her up in the story so I already wrote a picture book about that and I was told that it had was going to be good for children who move a lot so children who are in in the army like in the forces those that from those families and also I was thinking children who are in boarding school you know who might be away from their families as well and spending you know their time with their holidays in boarding school true that's so yeah. I completely agree with you and with this I would love to ask you what services do you offer to those who experience grief and loss? Yes. Because you do all this with children, with adults. So what kind of services do you offer? Yeah, so I go, I go into the schools, I go to libraries and I there go to go. Yeah, other places, you know, health and wellbeing fairs, events to read my books. And then I have a group of children sitting there and we chat about these topics and about these themes. And I ask them about, you know their lives as well and um i talk about animals a lot as well because they they what helped me overcome my miscarriage and keep me in a good place in a better place mentally especially was when i had my first dog and that was not long after i had the, my miscarriage and because i was so focused on the puppy i really didn't have time to think about too much else and it i was always so happy you know, to have the puppy around me. So for me, animals have been, you know, and I have a dog and two cats. So animals have, have always supported me um, to, in the, my darkest times. And that's why I write about them and how we can learn so much about how, what they're like in their lives, you know, forgiveness and being in the moment. Um, yeah, and just bringing joy and, and, and love and wherever they go. So, um, yes, I read uh, in different places. I offer a writing course for people because one of the things that, again, has helped me um, is to just write about my experiences and just have it out of my head and on paper. And then that way it's not stored here. It's not suppressed. It's out here. And I've started reading from my my um, I've written a, a memoir. I started reading from my memoir. When you write things, it lifts those emotions that are dense. You know, there's guilt and the shame are so dense, and you might be suppressing talking about 
you know, how you dislike your body, for example, and you don't tell anybody. But when you write about these things, it's suddenly out there. And it's almost as if you shed a layer, you shed a layer of that, that shame. And then when people read it, if you allow them to read it, and they accept it, and they say, hey, you're a good writer. And that's really helped me. You accept yourself as well. True. And so I offer writing for well-being workshops. But my favorite thing is storytelling. I've been a storyteller all my life. And I think through sharing our stories, we connect in a way, you know, that in no other way. We used to have an oral tradition before we ever wrote. And I love going into a circle where everybody's exactly equal, young, old, whatever, whoever background, you could be the richest person in the world or not, but we're all equal in the circle. And we all just share our stories on whatever theme it might be. Thank you. Oh, wow. <laughs> Thank you, Hilda, for sharing. I'm loving you. I love because you sit in circles. Nobody below you, nobody above you. They are all the same. It doesn't really matter. Thank you for sharing that to write books. Thank you for sharing that with writing, right? Sometimes we are ashamed, right? Condition, ashamed, we feel guilt by speaking, speaking or, or um, you know, telling somebody about things. But when we write it down, yeah. it has the same releasing effect, right? It's like, mm. I feel like a relief. Oh, oh my God, I said it, I wrote it down. It yeah. just feels different. You yes. feel lighter. You feel exactly you that heaviness in your heart and in your body. It's like, I just exactly. put it out. And that's very, very important because we don't, through writing. So that's why I invite you all these guys. And thank you, Hilda, for that. Write everything down. That's why I think that it's important. journaling is important. Just write a diary. Just take a piece of paper. Just do, I mean, or on your computer okay i i advise write by hand but that's me because <laughs> but we live in a era of technology do it on your phone do it on your laptop or whatever you have tablet just write say it. don't say it out loud if it doesn't feel right but write it out and that helps greatly greatly mm -hmm. and i also know about you and i would love to share this if you allow me that you are an amazing energy worker oh. and you are in rohani this yeah. is a very new concept for me i am working with reiki i work with energy healing but rohani it's a very new That's concept nice. right yeah and if you don't mind please share a little bit more about what is rohani how does it work how can help of obviously it helps it's energy work so it's no question about them <laughs> yeah yeah rahani is like reiki but it's just as a slightly faster vibration and slightly higher frequency so reiki comes from gaia it comes from the earth it was channeled about 100 years ago rahani was only channeled in 2002 to someone called carol stacy who is still alive she's nearly 80 years old a phenomenal woman and she woke up one day and in her bedroom there was this logos who is the teacher for the universe who helps us to raise our consciousness and evolve as a human race and he was standing in her bedroom seven foot tall and she thought she had you know gone crazy but her husband saw him too and said talked about him so she realized that she hadn't and um anyway so rahani comes from the planets and celestial beings not from the earth it's from the pleiades andromeda and sirius and it means of the heart so there's a pink ray of light that vibrates on the heart center and when you're attuned to the four symbols the three symbols for rahani um truth love and compassion and you get attuned into your solar plexus into your heart and into your third eye if you want to be a teacher you can also you'll know what the, there's a fourth symbol as well so um, what it has done for myself and many, I've attuned 25 practitioners and I've attuned one teacher. We were only allowed to attune face to face. So I wasn't allowed to attune during lockdown at all mm -hmm. because of the, um, you know, the rules. But now we're allowed to attune uh, online. So this is fantastic. So I can now work with anybody globally and I, I cannot wait to do that. It's so powerful. It has transformed my life because you learn how to self-heal 
and Thank lift all, all the emotions that hold you back and all that all that negative inner voice that says you're not good enough you can't do this who do you think you are you know yeah. who do you think you are to stand up on stage and read from your book that was the voice in my head for such a long time Rahani helps you to lift it and you self-heal you can send distant healing mm -hmm. I was sending lots of distant healing to people during COVID times and um, you can um, work face to face as well. It's very Thank powerful. You. Thank you. Oh my God, I'm loving. I'm loving you more and more. <laughs> <laughs> I love being on your show, Christina. And because... and if you would like to learn, or you know anyone who would like to learn, I would love to teach them. It's one of my favorite things. So, guys, if you would love to know about the energy healing, if you would love to know more about Rahani, then reach out to Hilda. She's going to guide you. She's going to tell you how, how you can get there, what you can do. It's truth, love, and compassion. I'm loving yeah. it, so you already got me there. And the other thing is self-healing, right? Because yeah. every healing, guys, remember, I always tell this. Every healing is self-healing. You do it to yourself. You do it through channeling from the earth, from up there, from whatever, but you're doing the channeling and you cannot heal somebody else until you don't heal yourself. You cannot love yeah. somebody else until you are not in love with yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Right? And because Rahani, you... Yeah, Rahani is so great as well for people who've got animals, but they can't, can't afford the vet's bills. So I've had clients who have got horses and then how am I going to pay the vet's bills? So I've taught them and they then heal their, do the energy healing on their horses or their dogs. And also it has worked very well for children who have got ADHD. Yes. As well. So because it balances the energy in the body. Oh, yes. yes, it is true. Shpresa is asking you here now, why having a pet at home makes people peaceful, quieter and kind? So we just go back a little bit to the previous mm. and, and answer to, to Shpresa if you would love to. Well, I mean, they, they animals pick up on your energy straight away. They know. I have a cat. He's a boy. <laughs> yeah and they know and and they're you know and they and when they purr when they come close to you as you know that with the cats they're like sort of vibrating on, on your energy but also they bring in a calmness so and then so you're absorbing their energy it's like a contagious beautiful lovely thing and it calms you down and there's been lots of research you know it lowers your blood pressure and it makes you less anxious and of course at the bottom of it all is love you know at the bottom of all of this is love and um when you're in that place miracles happen that's when the magic happens and that's why you know i i, I don't think i could live without animals in my life now mm. i'm loving what you're saying love is the you know love is the universal language the whole universe it's unconditional love you know yeah, yeah. matter is a matter of fact, it does not exist. It's all energy and sound, vibration, right? And colors. And that's the, the element, the component of it. It's love. Yeah. And when we tap into that energy and we go into our heart center and we connect with love, then we see the world through the eyes of love. And then we see the world completely differently. And absolutely. It's, yeah. I'm saying it's one of the highest not the higher frequency possible and that's love, that's unconditional love. And getting back to animals, my cat, his name is Jasper. He's a very stubborn, he's a cat, okay? <laughs> so he has his own rules, his own cat. When I feel good, he just, you know, is around me when he's hungry, so he doesn't even bother when I'm feeling down. Or I know I'm going through something. My cat is always on my lap, on my bed, near me. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love he, Jasper. <laughs> he always knows. So when I'm, you know, sometimes I go to sleep. Sometimes he visits Maya. She's my daughter. Maya, she's fine. She's a perfectly balanced child, really, honestly. He doesn't really bother. Oh, she's fine. And then she comes to my husband, you know, he comes to my husband, my husband is fine. I'm going to Christina. If I'm fine, <laughs> then he goes down and he sleeps, you know, in front of the bed. 
if I'm feeling tired or low, he always, always keeps up almost at my head. Gosh. Or sometimes he goes down to my feet. But then, based on his behavior, I can kind of analyze my own state, uh. where I am right now. And then I sit and I'm asking myself, where are you right now? Where I am right now, emotionally? Where is my soul? How am I feeling? How am I truly feeling? Because sometimes, you know, people go, oh, Linda, how are you doing? How was your day today? Just for the sake of asking, and you say good English word, well, I'm fine, thank you. But you're not. <laughs> <laughs> that is the automatic response it's very automatic. often. Exactly. And, and you're not. You're not good at all. But this is how we respond. And then we do this, you know, with the animals around. We can do this self-check. How do I feel? How my, my, my pet behaves around me, and then I know how I'm feeling. I can, I can, you know, kind of inventory of that, of how I'm feeling, really. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They're so sensitive, aren't they? They're so attuned and so wise. I don't know. Sometimes I feel like, do we deserve them? <laughs> That's just so, animals are so amazing. But the good thing about pets is that in, in their next lives, they're going to be in human form the most probably. I'm gonna, <laughs> <laughs> you know, there is um, Dolores Cannon, okay? I read a lot about her and ab about her work. I love, I love very much Dolores Cannon. She talks about the um, three ways of volunteers and there's what she explains, you know, during her hypnotherapy sessions, you know, how, what people channel and what she channeled that apparently it looks like those animals who are, which are, you know, pets, Right now, their next life, because the soul want to grow, they mm -hmm. choose to be in human form because this is what they want to experience next. So I'm oh guys, I'm not it going to. It might well be true. It might well be true. I mean, she's so so spiritually evolved, you know, and I've heard the same from other psychics or uh, mediums as well. I can say to you that um, definitely there's something about it. When I've experienced bereavement and someone's passed, it's happened so many times now there'll be a moth or there'll be some unusual um, animal in my pre in the presence in the house or something like that. When I had my miscarriage, it was, um, when was that? 2006 now, so quite a long time ago. And it was when I was four months pregnant and um, we uh, had our baby's body cremated. And then we went to a church. We were living in New Zealand at the time. And it was just outside of Wellington, the capital. Beautiful, beautiful church uh, with its white uh, board and a kind of a red roof, like a steeple. And there was a tree by the church, big, 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 big tree and a beautiful um, ko-fi, which are yellow flowers that were out. And we walked around the church and we put the um, ashes of our child uh, on the grass by the church. And then we were in tears and we were hugging. And just as that, that moment, there was a bird that started crying at the top of the tree. And I have never seen a bird like that. And I have never heard a cry like that. And it sounded like a human voice when it cried, like a baby's voice. Mm. And it cried for a little bit. It was the most exquisite sound, but also slightly mournful, but also like, um, don't worry, everything's OK. okay. And, and, and I just knew that this was the spirit of that child in, this, in the form of a bird. Yeah, thank you, Hilda, for sharing that. I really, really, truly appreciate. Thank you so much. Okay, going back, 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 by back, Christina. <laughs> Are there any resources you can recommend to our listeners today? There's lots of books on um, bereavement. There's one that many people have read and recommend called Grief Works by a, an author called Julia Samuels. Um, there's also um, Helping for the Helper by uh, someone called Babette Rothschild. So Helping for the Helper is recommended. Um, uh, my personal favourite when I was going through grief was a book called um, Don't, um, Don't Kiss Them Goodbye. And it was by somebody who said, they're always around you, you know, 
whatever a lot of people don't believe in life after death I know but um this this book helped me a lot because it was about knowing that they had passed in spirit and they were still around you and because right we're all energy and one of the laws of energy is that energy won't disappear it will just change its form thank you how how can it disappear it changes its form <clears throat> and so um this book don't kiss them goodbye and, and i can't remember the author uh, i think it's julia um dubois i think comes up she, it was a, it's a fantastic book with all her experiences of of seeing people who've passed to the spirit world and you know there's there's kind of almost um they wish for you to have a better life they want you to have a better life and yeah. and, to, and to be happy and, and not and and to laugh and not feel guilty about laughing so if somebody dies you know you don't need to feel guilty if you have a laugh about a joke or something makes you laugh you know it's okay um, because they want you to be happy they want you to maybe find love again if you know if you find that an, another that's person true. to love that's true that's true and thank you for sharing that because here's my way of thinking we are energy beings right and you just said that energy cannot be created cannot be destroyed mm -hmm. only can be transformed yeah. now as energy beings we don't disappear okay we are not destroyed therefore we transform yeah so in one form or another we are together yes right yes so that is something what helps greatly if you open your heart and you open your mind mind yeah you open yeah, your mind especially to understand and you silence your ego a little bit yes. you put your ego on its corner and you open your heart and you allow your to see with your heart and to think with your heart instead of thinking with your mind which trying to find explanations to everything right then you will realize that you will have that knowing that we are always together in some I, kind of shape and form in any kind it's i've had so much evidence of it my, my father passed and his favorite song was um patsy klein crazy i turned on the radio in my car Patsy Klein crazy just after he died it's like what's going on and it happened many times and at the time I was really skeptical I was one of the most skeptical people in the world about all of this this is how we start <laughs> yeah um and then my daughter I called her Elsa because of uh I wanted that lioness do you remember that film Born Free about this lioness called Elsa it was made in the 60s and it was um, a, a lioness that had been born in captivity but freed and she got used to living in the wild and she mated and had cubs and all of this this is very unusual to, for that to happen anyway they called the lioness Elsa and, and for me having a daughter who could do whatever she wanted in life who was free to do whatever she wanted born free was one of my favorite films and the soundtrack there's a beautiful song and then just after she was born this soundtrack was came up on in the car again i mean that's a really yeah. unusual song how often does that happen but exactly and you know that there are no coincidences no coincidences. nothing happens everything happens for a reason every cause is an effect so wow thank you <laughs> yeah. yeah we're on the same wavelength and yeah you just experiment be yeah. open you know look out for signs and signals because they're everywhere you've lost count of the number of times i've seen coins on the ground i've seen feathers on the ground you know say and these are often signs that you're on the right track that's true i agree and what i'm saying is we very often work with life through life with our eyes closed and our shoes on if we really open our eyes and take our shoes off then we see we really see what's around us so yeah. I'm not going to leave it with that. Otherwise, we're going to stay here until tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How it's can it. people get in touch with you, Hilda? So, guys, if you loved, and I'm sure you did, and if you think that Hilda can help you, and I'm sure she can, where people can find you, Hilda? So, I'm on the Facebook. I'm on Insta. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. 
Um, and I'm also on my email, which is hildacallop at yahoo.co.uk. And soon we'll have our website up for Roots of Hope. So just look out for that in the next couple of weeks. And um, yeah, very exciting. I'm so happy and excited. I would, I'm, I'm really, really looking forward to have your website, website up and running. I'm going to add Hilda's um, social media platform sites, you know, the, the links in the comments below. So if, if you feel like you... I put that person, on here, yeah. Then just please feel free to reach out to her. And before we finish our True Sunday from today, I, again, I'm going to repeat myself. I don't like to ask, oh, would you like to give some advice? I don't give, I don't take. <laughs> but is there, <laughs> is there any message what would you love to share with our audience today as a final thought? <laughs> oh gosh. Well, I I now say live life each live each day to the full because life is absolutely precious. And um, at the same time, don't take life too seriously. Thank you. That's a great advice. And I'm gonna leave you with this, guys. Don't take life too seriously because we we take it too seriously. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Hilda, for honoring you with your presence. Thank you for all your hearts, loves, comments. I really, really appreciate all of you. I'm going to see you next time for the next episode of the Truth Runners Talk Show. Until then, as always, I'm sending you lots of love and light. Bye for now. <laughs>